Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. My name is David Gellis. I'm a business reporter here at the New York Times and the corner office columnist. As part of our coverage of this crisis, we're trying out some new formats these days, and I wanna thank you all for joining us on this call. This is the latest in a series of live conversations with independent business leaders about how they are confronting the challenges facing their organizations during this unusual time. Today, we're really grateful to be joined by Dr. Stephen Corwin, President and Chief Executive of New York Presbyterian, who's here to discuss the formidable challenges facing his organization. during this pandemic. Few have a quick housekeeping note. This call is being recorded and you may submit questions at any time during the event using the Q&A feature in Zoom. We'll get to them in a little bit. Again, this event is being recorded and is also an audio only event. Steve, welcome and thanks so much for being here. Let's get into it. So thanks, Steve, David. If you would take us back in time to what feels like a different world now, to, to the last days of December and the first days of January. When did you and your team first become aware of this novel coronavirus coming out of Wuhan? And what were your initial reactions and what steps did you start to take to potentially prepare for its arrival in New York? I think anytime you see a viral infection like that in any part of the world, it raises your antennae. And certainly when we saw what was happening in, in Wuhan, uh, we were concerned about the possibility, uh, given globalization, travel, et cetera, uh, that it would come to the U.S. Uh, so we started really asking our infectious disease people at that time, uh, what is this virus? Um, how does it behave? What's the mortality associated with it? And as you recall, there were a lot of conflicting signals then around how mortal is this? How communicable is it? Is it very contagious? Is it less contagious? Were the Chinese uh, somehow hiding some of the numbers? Uh, but we were concerned enough to start preparing for what if a pandemic uh, occurs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then of course, over, over those first weeks in January and into the first several weeks of February, we started to learn more. And it was clear that it began to spread and would, would most likely inevitably come to New York. A and then your preparations, I imagine, uh, began becoming more serious. I suspect there was some testing you wanted to do, but perhaps weren't able to do as effectively as you like. And I suspect you also started doing some more serious modeling about what this would really look like if it did come to New York. Yeah, I think that um, we took a look at, at the Wuhan uh, experience, but it wasn't until we saw Italy that we said, we're going to have to model this out because it's clear it's going to come here. I, we were hampered um, in, in February by uh, the, the faulty CDC test, as well as the insistence that the CDC do any potential uh, testing where we thought somebody might be positive. And if you recall, there were strict definitions around, was there a travel history? How could you get the sample to the CDC? There was an approval process. That really, uh, to be honest with you, uh, held us back. Uh, and quite frankly, I think during that period of time, we missed, as, as, as many uh, have uh, surmised, the, the idea of community spread. Uh, but when we saw Italy and we started to model out what that looked like, we became extremely concerned and started really ramping up our preparations. And part of those preparations were, of course, assessing how much personal protective equipment you had, how many ventilators and ICU beds you had. Um, and we've heard these harrowing stories of doctors having to buy gear off the backs of trucks in, in, in dark parking lots. Uh, this morning, I published a story about how UCSF in San Francisco actually turned to Mark Benioff for help to get the equipment they needed. What did you do? What did New York Presbyterian do when you realized just what kind of actual resources were going to be needed to combat this virus? Well, I, I saw that story and, and we actually know the people at UCSF quite well. Uh, and they were able to sort of manufacture, as you so noted in your story, their own supply chain. Um, what I would say just as a preface to what we did was that our whole surmise around pandemic uh, preparation was, uh, I think, flawed. 
The first was that you could do quick and universal testing and contact tracing quite easily. And all the pandemic models that we had looked at assumed that. Well, that was strike one because that didn't happen. Uh, the second was that our stockpiles of PPE, which we had about four to five weeks, despite you know a relatively uh, tight supply chain, we had four to five weeks of PPE. We thought we could weather uh, the first surge of a pandemic. That turned out to be completely false. I think um, I've mentioned this before, but we went from 4,000 masks a day to 40,000 masks a day during the initial part of the crisis to 90,000 masks a day um, at the peak of the crisis as one example of PPE. And we did not have uh, the stockpiles uh, to, to make up for that. And then the third was, we felt that with a modest surge in ICU beds, we had 450 ICU beds, uh, that if we surged to about 550 ICU beds, we would be okay. And that was a gross underestimate. We got to 900 ICU beds uh, by the peak of this. So, so our preparation and our surmise around the pandemic was, I think, insufficient. And I think certainly at the state and the national level, we know that that also was insufficient in terms of stockpiling. So we were on a hunt for uh, PPE right from the beginning. We used our contacts in China uh, as well. Uh, there was a free-for-all for this. Uh, we were able to secure some supplies from China. Uh, our manufacturing uh, capabilities in the U.S., which were hampered, those companies were able to divert uh, uh, PPE to us, uh, thankfully, Owings and Minor, Cardinal. Um, but we were really scraping by the first few weeks, uh, and it was tough. Uh, we didn't have to uh, buy things off the back of trucks, but we were very careful about how many N95s we were using, the, the mask, the respirator mask, uh, and so on. That then morphed into, uh, we're going to need more ventilators. Mm. And that was, uh, so once we had a little bit of breathing space on the protective equipment, it became, would we have enough ventilators? Uh, and that was a saga in and of itself. Well, I want to come back to this notion of, of assumptions and what lessons we might learn um, coming out of this when we finally get to the other side. But, but first, I want you to take us to March 1st. Um, up until that point, uh, we knew it was coming. You knew it was inevitably going to get here. But then what happens uh, on March 1st at one of your facilities north of New York City? On March 1st, uh, uh, in our Lawrence Hospital facility uh, in Southern Westchester, we uh, had the first case of community spread of the virus uh, with a 52-year-old uh, male lawyer. And that was the first time that we had seen uh, somebody who did not have a travel history come down with the infection. We had admitted him to the institution on a Friday with pneumonia. Uh, he tested negative for the viral panels. Uh, we assumed it was a bacterial pneumonia. When he didn't get better by Sunday, we did send the coronavirus test out and he was positive. And that's when we knew we had community spread in New York State. And that's when we knew uh, that once you have community spread like that, that the outbreak was going to look pretty similar to Wuhan and Italy. Uh, and that's when we really understood that this was going to be a crisis for New York City, for Southern Westchester, uh, et cetera. Uh, we then implemented what we call our incident command structure that very day um, and have been living with that structure uh, since then, uh, which, which coordinates all of our central activities and is something that we use for any disaster, man-made or not. So, for example, we put that in place uh, during Superstorm Sandy, uh, we knew we were going to need that type of coordinated response once once that happened. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you certainly have uh, over these last six weeks. Steve, take us inside the ERs and the ICUs over the past month or so. What's it been like for your doctors and nurses on the ground? You know, we see what we see uh, in our paper and others. We catch perhaps glimpses of it on the, the evening news, but you understand it. You have a visceral understanding of it. Can you just talk to us from, you know, from your experience on the ground and, and, and from your heart about what it's like really on the front lines right now? 
Well, I'm a cardiologist and an intensive care medicine specialist by training. Um, I lived through and took care of many patients through the AIDS epidemic, uh, another horrific uh, uh, story, but I've never seen anything like this. Uh, the sheer numbers of patients, the fact that all of them were really quite ill, uh, the number of patients that needed to be put immediately on a ventilator, uh, the number of patients that came into the emergency room uh, about ready to die, uh, the same in our ICUs. Uh, it really was, uh, even for somebody like myself, who has taken care of many patients through the years, uh, really startling. Uh, and uh, the physical and emotional toll this has taken on uh, everybody who works in our system, uh, particularly in the EDs and the ICUs, but throughout the system is just enormous. It almost feels like the AIDS epidemic compressed into a six-week period of time. It was really that uh, striking and that, and that vulnerable. And I just think that it's uh, something I've never, I've never witnessed in 40 years of medicine. At the peak of this surge, uh, at least this first surge, what was the single biggest challenge that, that your hospital system encountered? Uh, was it the hours that your doctors and nurses were having to work? Was it the lack of equipment? Was it, was it the availability of space? What was, what was that one or two constraints that really uh, posed the biggest challenge when you were trying to give the best care to every single person who walked in? You know, David, um, I've thought a lot about this, and I, and I think that there's no simple answer to it because the pieces are so interconnected. The physical space is interconnected to the staffing. It's inter interconnected to the equipment. Uh, but I would say that the biggest challenge we faced was uh, being able to create enough ICU beds to, to withstand the high tide, if you will. Uh, and so we had to create um, uh, ICUs out of operating rooms, ICUs out of procedure suites, ICUs out of areas that had typically been conference areas. Uh, and that meant construction. It meant creating negative pressure rooms, which were necessary. It meant piping in oxygen. Uh, it, it was a whole range of things just to create that capacity. And then on top of it, as you can well imagine, uh, and I'm sure the listeners will understand, if you double your number of ICU beds over the course of a three-week period of time, who staffs it? And we had to come up with a completely novel way of staffing the ICUs to, to be able to deliver the excellent care that people expect from a hospital system like mine. Uh, and so that really, those two were really interconnected. And then if you added on top of that, we weren't sure whether we had enough ventilators, you can have the perfect storm. So there, uh, thanks to the ingenuity of uh, intensivists, of our respiratory therapists, we were able to create uh, ventilators out of uh, anesthesia machines. We were able to split ventilators to be able to ventilate two patients simultaneously. Uh, and so we were able to get by uh, by virtue of some of, those, uh, some of those techniques, as well as getting ultimately some ventilators from uh, the national and state stockpiles. Mm -hmm. And so where are we now, Steve? Um, we're six weeks into the real initial first surge in the, the New York area. Uh, how is your hospital group doing? And, and how are you adjusting to prepare for the months ahead, which of, which of course has a huge amount of unknowns in it, right? Yes, the curve is leveling off now and the numbers are coming down, but that's because everyone's been staying home. What are, are your concerns as you look forward in the months ahead about what do these measures that you've just described in so much detail need to be maintained uh, or what other changes you might need to make in, in, to meet the challenges of the, the weeks and months uh, and hopefully not longer than that ahead? You know, David, first, you know, just as a citizen, I think that having lived through this, it's really important for people in other parts of the country to really understand how horrific this can be if an outbreak happens, uh, whether, you, whether it's Detroit, whether it's in Louisiana, whether it's in Georgia. So I worry specifically around opening up too early and having a significant recrudescence of this. And in the absence of 
universal testing, I, I would say, in the absence of substantially increased testing, you're not going to know. So this experiment in, in Georgia, we're not going to know for a few weeks whether there's going to be a huge spike in the infections. And I know people have talked about what's happening in Sweden. If you look at the curve in Sweden compared to the in Stockholm, compared to the, the curve uh, in New York City, where the lockdown happened, uh, it's still, the incidence is still rising in Stockholm. So I'm not convinced that the relaxation um, is going to be uh, uh, beneficial to the economy if we do it too quickly. Here, we know we can't do it too quickly. We can't get back to where we were. Uh, I'm very proud of all the hospital systems in New York coming together, working together. We may have staggered, but the, the, the wall wasn't breached uh, and no one wants to get back there. Our view of it is we have to keep a fair amount of our excess ICU capacity. Hmm. We have to stockpile uh, the PPE, the protective equipment, that as we start to deliver care to patients that quite frankly need it and that we've deferred, we've got to do it carefully. Uh, we've got to make sure that uh, patient safety is our, is our top priority. Um, we're going to be living with masks and protective gear for quite a while. It's going to change the way we live as a country. It's certainly going to change the way that my institution operates. And we're looking at every aspect of that, from going into a doctor's examining room and how to clean it, to uh, how many virtual visits are we going to do, to making sure that we space hours so that we don't congregate uh, patients, to making sure that we don't have more than four or five people in an elevator at any one point in time. You can go down the list of all these sort of things that we take for granted because we're social human beings. We love crowds. I love to go to football games and, and soccer games. Uh, those types of things, uh, you know, are going to be difficult for us as a society to get back to. And in particular for a healthcare institution, uh, the, the idea of 40 people in a waiting room, not going to happen. Uh, the idea of people congregating in a cafeteria, not going to happen. So all of those things we're trying to rethink them. Wow. Wow. And well, as you just alluded to, the, the impacts that you're already seeing at your institution extend well beyond New York Presbyterian and are going to affect all corners of the economy and our lives for some years to come. A reminder, quick housekeeping note. You may submit questions at any time during this event using the Q&A feature in Zoom. We'll get to them in a few minutes, but I've got a few more for, for Steve before we do that. Um, Steve, I want you to talk about, about uh, New York Presbyterian itself as an institution. It's a vital one for the city. And this, as you've uh, told us, is putting enormous strain on your resources, including the financial resources. You've got more than a dozen hospitals and medical facilities across the New York area, revenues in excess of $8 billion annually. You see more than 47,000 people a year. And yet uh, this is taking an enormous toll uh, on the institution's balance sheet, I, I presume, especially with so many elective procedures uh, postponed for the time being and the enormous costs that you just detailed in dealing with this. So I wonder if you can talk to us in some detail about what specifics you are thinking about in regards to your plan to weather these staggering deficits under which uh, your and other hospitals are currently operating. Well, I think there are a couple of, of, of key points. The first is uh, we recognize that uh, the, the country as a whole has suffered uh, drastically economically. Uh, and I don't know, 20 million, 26 million people out of work. So I think it's, it's, it's important to put the problems of my hospital or hospital system in the context of quite a severe recession uh, in, in, the, in the economy and, and uncertainty in, in terms of how quickly it will recover. Um, that being said, we think uh, that over the course of this pandemic, we anticipate that we'll lose uh, probably by year's end, close to a billion dollars, if not more than that. Um, and right now we're losing uh, on the order of about $400 million a month for all the reasons that you've said. Um, our view of coming out of it, uh, quite simply, is thankfully we've had the balance sheet to be able to withstand that. Uh, we have a board of trustees that's been 
uh, very supportive of making sure that we continue to be uh, the place that can deliver care to all New Yorkers. Uh, 33% of the patients we care for are on Medicaid. 50% uh, of the children we care for are on Medicaid. 50% uh, of our psychiatric populations on Medicaid. So we have a profound commitment to the communities of New York that we just can't back off of. Uh, and that means that we have to be able to deliver high quality care. So we'll take the short term hit on the balance sheet. I'm very fearful of the notion that we're gonna lay off people. I, I, I will resist that as long as I possibly can. Uh, and I'm hoping to avoid that period for a very simple reason. Morally speaking, uh, all of the people that work for us have run through walls to get us through this crisis. Uh, I can't turn around and say, you know, the finances aren't great, so we're gonna, we're gonna furlough people. So we're gonna do everything we can to have everybody who has a job keep a job, uh, everybody who has a salary to be able to continue to, to, uh, to maintain uh, their living for their family. I think that's what uh, we owe to, to the workers who work for us. It's going to be tough. Uh, yeah. It's going to be tough sledding. Part of what we will have to do is curtail our capital spend to conserve cash. We've been able to get some money from the CARES Act, which, which will help. Uh, Medicare has uh, fast forwarded a few months worth of payment for us. It'll have to be paid back, but nevertheless, it helps our cash position. So we think our liquidity is okay uh, for the time being. Uh, and we think our solvency is not in question um, and that it will come back and we'll just have to weather the storm. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned in, in that last answer just how important your, your employees were to you. I wonder if you can speak uh, a bit to the toll that this is all taking, specifically on your doctors and nurses. Uh, you mentioned uh, that health impacts on them, but there's also the uh, emotional well-being, which I know is of deep concern to all of us, especially in the wake of yesterday's tragic news about Dr. Breen, one of your doctors who sadly- Well, Dr. Breen was a very respected uh, physician um, a very loyal and caring physician. She had a leadership position with us uh, in one of our emergency departments at the Allen Hospital, which is in Northern Manhattan. Uh, a terrific contributor, a warm and generous person. So a calamity like that is just um, devastating. And it's really a catastrophe. Uh, she took her own life uh, on leave uh, with her family in Charlottesville, but I am sure that the scars of what she had, had been through uh, in our emergency department uh, contributed to, uh, to her loss of life and her despondency and the feeling that she had to take her life. And that's just um, devastating. Uh, the entire hospital community is really uh, impacted by that. We are sure that we will see more depression uh, PTSD. Uh, in that very same emergency department, we lost one of our senior nurses uh, this past Friday uh, who succumbed to the disease itself in one of our ICUs. Um, so the impact on the psyche of our frontline workers in that emergency department has been uh, profound. Certainly, um, we have a lot of programs in place for employees. We probably will have, will have to do more in terms of group therapy sessions, in terms of individual one-on-ones, et cetera. Doctors like to take a lot on their shoulders. Healthcare workers like to take a lot on their shoulders. But this has been an enormous strain, as, as we talked about earlier. And um, this is just one of those things that as a, as a leader, um, you just a 49-year-old brilliant physician, um, it's just, it's just devastating, to be honest with you. Well, our, our hearts go out to you and the entire community there. This is a, actually an opportune segue to the first audience question. Uh, and I think it speaks directly to what you were just uh, navigating right there in that answer. And it's from Ben who asks, can you talk about your communication strategy, both internally and externally? And, and what I hear you trying to do in this conversation right now is balance the, the reality uh, of the ravages of this virus with the, the imperative to keep looking forward, to try to stay as optimistic as we reasonably can, 
and to keep trying to, to bring people uh, the energy they need to, to show up for work every day. So how have you thought about as a leader uh, balancing that you know, high wire act of communicating the, the reality of this, both to your team and then to the broader public? Well, let's start with internal and then we can move to external. Um, internally, once we set up our virtual command structure, we had both 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. meetings every day with all the senior management across all of our 10, uh, now 11 hospital campuses to make sure we were coordinating all of our activities, that every, everybody's approach was the same in terms of how do you manage airways, how do you deal with uh, PPE issues, who's, where's the hot spot, is everyone uh, capable of dealing the ICU care? Do we need to redeploy or reassign physicians, nurses, et cetera, to one of our locations that's, that's becoming stressed? So those were, those were the management communications. Uh, then uh, Dr. Faris, Laura Faris, who is our chief operating officer, had daily 10 a.m. briefings uh, that went out over, uh, over WebEx so that every employee could look every day at what was happening. If they weren't available for the 10 a.m. Uh, briefings, we had a library of them that people could refer to because there were thousands of questions, uh, questions about infection control, questions about PPE, questions about staffing, questions about uh, domiciling people. We had a domicile uh, over 2,000 healthcare workers who wanted to stay away from their families during this. We had to find them uh, apartments, uh, mm. and we found them dormitory rooms in, in, at Columbia, apartments, hotels, etc. Uh, we made a decision that we didn't want our employees to, uh, to have to travel on mass transit. We have a 50 bus system that operates across all of our campuses to deliver uh, healthcare workers to those campuses. So there were questions about that. So that daily webcast was crucial for us to communicate with the entire organization. We have 47,000 employees and that was, I think, very helpful. Um, it also was a communication mechanism that we used for our board so that the board of the hospital could be updated uh, on a daily basis with what was going on and what the issues were. Externally, I think that I felt strongly that it was very important to convey what the issues were. Certainly the issues around PPE, the issues around getting ventilators, what we were facing on the front lines, so that uh, certainly the city and the country as a whole could understand what the health system was going through. And I felt it was very important to externally um, communicate that. Uh, hospitals tend to advertise. We stopped all our advertising. We thought that that was, uh, would be ludicrous to do mm. at, at this point in time. So the communication was, externally to various newspapers, outlets, uh, television, cable, et cetera, uh, and then internally, as, I, as I've said to you. And I think that uh, it was pretty effective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, that's, that's insightful to hear. Um, and, it, and it brings me back to this notion in a certain way of, of these assumptions you had. And, and I want to get to more audience questions in just a sec. But you talked about those three sort of main assumptions uh, around the supply chain, around your own capacity, and around what the government might be able to provide. And as a leader, again, how do you reconcile the, the fact that, as you stated, those assumptions were flawed um, going forward? You know, what do you miss? What did you miss in the accounting of this, the Monday morning quarterbacking, to use a football analogy? And how do you change the way you assume, the way you prepare going forward from this point? Well, I think that if you don't do, if you're in a leadership position and you don't do soul searching about what could I as a leader have done better, what could we have been more prepared for? How did we look at things and how do we look at things now? You're making a huge mistake. So I think you have to take a clear-eyed view of what you got right and what you got wrong. What we got right uh, was all the things that we've talked about in terms of the communication, the preparation, the ability to ramp up, uh, the ability to care for really sick patients, the galvanizing of a formidable medical and nursing and, and, and frontline worker community, the morale, et cetera. What we got wrong got the supply chain entirely wrong. Mm -hmm. I think that we as a country have to think about the supply chain differently. 
you know, all the manufacturing of the gowns, uh, masks, et cetera, were for all intents and purposes in China or ironically in Italy. And so we were cut off from the supply chain hmm. and, and we did not have enough of a stockpile to, to deal with it. The same goes for uh, ventilator supply. I think that uh, the anticipatory need for this was, uh, was far less than what the reality actually occurred. I also think that because we get super specialized in medicine, we tend to lock ourselves into uh, the ophthalmologist does eyes and the ear, nose and throat person does ears and throat. Um, we have to have a lot more flexibility going forward. We proved uh, in this crisis that we could create a sort of layered uh, uh, intensive care uh, management system where we, where we redeployed a lot of physicians who had not done intensive care medicine or, or that type of medicine in quite a while. Um, they did a remarkable job, uh, but we have to be much more structured about giving people those experiences so that we can turn it on and turn it off as need be. And the same thing goes for uh, ICU bed capacity. We're not gonna go back to the ICU bed capacity we had. We're gonna have a fairly large reserve, larger than, than what we previously had had, uh, and to be able to flex it up and flex it down. So flexibility, both on the space side and the staffing side, I think is something that we were not prepared for. Mm -hmm. We've got another question from a, a listener here, and, and like so many of us, uh, he is, it sounds like, just trying to follow the evolution of this virus and, and how individuals are coping with it and hospitals are treating it. And, and the question is, how are the treatments of patients with COVID-19 evolving over time? What are you doing differently for someone who comes into the ER today that perhaps you weren't doing six weeks ago? Well, we've learned a lot. Um, so let's start out with, uh, we, don't, we don't know when a vaccine will, will come about, 12 months at the earliest, um, 18 months. Uh, no treatment yet has been effective. Uh, the, the enthusiasm around hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin was misplaced. The enthusiasm around remdesivir was misplaced. Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while for us to get to, he, here's an effective therapy. And, and, and you can all recall who are old enough, uh, the struggles we had with finding um, uh, appropriate treatment for uh, HIV. So I, I think that uh, grasping at, you know, this is going to work tomorrow, uh, we have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that it's going to take a while. In terms of what we've learned, I think we've learned a lot about the supportive care of these patients, in particular that a lot of them uh, have their kidneys shut down and they require a dialysis. Uh, that was something that wasn't uh, anticipated at the beginning of this. And uh, trying to intubate or ventilate them later rather than earlier uh, to try to get them over the hump without, um, without putting them on the ventilator seems to be of help. And this is this idea of putting them prone as opposed to supine and ventilating them that way. But these are all measures around supportive care to try to get them over the course of the virus. Uh, without trying to shock any of the listeners, uh, if you're hospitalized with COVID, um, the, the mortality is close to 20%. And if you're on a ventilator with COVID, your mortality is in the 65 to 70% range in some places higher, in some places a little lower, but it's very high. So we need a treatment. Uh, we've learned a lot about how to deliver great supportive care, but it's still not um, a substitute for uh, an effective treatment. Mm -hmm. Related to that, Steve, uh, Madeline asks, over the last week, have you seen an increase in ER visits due to ingestion or injection of bleach or other disinfectants? We have not, thankfully. That's good to hear. Um, I thought that was uh, not uh, a particularly well-conceived set of remarks. Um, and I do think that um, we need to be scientifically rigorous about anything that we do. Um, and sometimes the public uh, needs to hear the reality of, in the absence of randomized clinical trials, with a, 
sound scientific rationale, it's going to be hard for us to get to a definitive treatment. And so we've not seen that. Where we have seen an increase in ER visits, which actually is a good sign, is that people are now coming in uh, who have had strokes and heart attacks and things of that nature. Not that the stroke or heart attack is a good thing, but that people were very afraid of coming into the emergency room before and may have suffered these maladies at home. So we are seeing a return, uh, a more of a return to normal. I would say that um, the ERs are lighter than they've been uh, in terms of COVID. Our ICUs are still pretty heavy with it. Um, and uh, we think that that'll, it'll be that way for a while. We do worry about uh, a resurgence of infection. Uh, uh, I was just uh, watching the, the planes fly down the East River before uh, the Blue Angels, and you would have thought that nobody was social distancing. So, or you saw the beaches in California over the weekend. We've got to be really careful about uh, assuming that uh, this is over. It is not over. Uh, and for those of you who are historians and have read the history of the 1918 pandemic, the second wave was far worse than the first. And so we've got to be really, really mindful of that. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could also comment as, as you talk about those, those terrible statistics from those who do wind up hospitalized and on ventilators. In, in recent weeks, we've learned a lot about the racial inequities uh, of this virus. It, is that reflective of what you've seen in your emergency rooms? Uh, and, and to what could you help us understand? Do you attribute that? We have. I think it's, it's uh, perhaps less stark than in other areas of the country, but it's still there. Uh, we have uh, a hospital in Queens that's very close to the Elmhurst Corona border. We saw a huge increase uh, in, in patients there. Uh, in, that, in, in that particular population, it was um, Asian or Hispanic. Uh, our Brooklyn Hospital has a large uh, percentage of African-American patients. And our uh, Columbia Hospital up at, uh, in northern Manhattan has a large percentage of uh, Dominican patients um, and Spanish-speaking patients from the islands. So we've seen that disparity. Um, I think you have social determinants of health are different uh, in some of the in, in some of the socioeconomically deprived groups, uh, certainly in black and brown uh, patients. Uh, so you have that aspect of it: uh, higher incidence of diabetes, uh, obesity, hypertension. Then you have the issue of uh, housing. And it's kind of hard to socially isolate yourself if you've got six people or seven people in a small apartment. Uh, so you have that aspect of it uh, as well. Uh, and then you have what was the pre-existing uh, health status of somebody, the, the social determinants, as I've said before. And in the absence of really effective primary care, uh, you see people coming in sicker and therefore they're more uh, vulnerable. So. Uh, it is something that, without question, we've got to address uh, as a society. I, I think that, um, you know, I think inequality is, is, is part of it, but I, th I think that the precariousness of the living situation coupled with the social determinants of health, coupled with the absence of effective primary care is a, is a toxic brew. Mm -hmm. uh, well... Thank you for all the good work you're trying to do to take care of each and every one who comes uh, through your doors. Uh, we clearly have some healthcare professionals uh, on the call right now, and there are several questions about, uh, again, sort of just taking us inside the ICU. So I'm going to bunch a few here together, and it really gets to the heart of how New York Presbyterian has been managing some of those uh, staffing stressors that you've uh, mentioned in a bit more granular level. So one listener asks, have you been able to maintain standard caregiver patient ratios even in the ICU? Another uh, reader uh, listener asks, how are you identifying exhaustion in team members for those people who really are on the front lines? This gets back to this notion of how are you taking care of the employees who are confronting this day in and day out? And another, uh, Mark asks, can you talk about some of the creative ways that you've had to staff your ICU? So just take us back inside those, those most acutely hit parts of your organization and tell us how you're managing. Yes, they're all related. And I think the, the short answer on, on that is uh, 
you can't possibly maintain the staffing ratios you had pre-COVID, um, particularly on the nursing level. So what we tried to do, or the intensive, or the intensivist level, uh, intensivist physician level, or for that matter, the respiratory therapy level. So what we tried to do was uh, create a pyramidal uh, structure. We redeployed a lot of uh, nurses, uh, pharmacists, resident physicians, attending physicians to layer beneath our most capable intensivists, whether it was an intensive care physician, intensive care nurse, intensive care respiratory therapist, et cetera. By doing that, and we redeployed about 1,000 nurses and 2,000 doctors, we were able essentially to staff up, uh, but not with the same ratio of one-to-one -one intensive care nurse to intensive care patient. So we would take that intensive care nurse and she would have three or he would have three patients, uh, but also that nurse was buttressed by other nurses who were helping her or him accomplish that job. And so we were able, to, I think, to adequately staff, but certainly it was far from ideal and certainly not our norm in terms of the way that we would look at staffing. That led, of course, to the issue of uh, uh, provider fatigue. And we were extremely concerned about that, especially early on, uh, because we had uh, people putting in 16, 17 hour days. We were able to sort of rotate our intensivists and rotate our intensive care nurses to avoid that um, uh, by and large, because of, again, we were able to redeploy and staff up. But there's no question that we were asking people uh, to suspend their normal work hours in order to make this happen. Uh, and that also, of course, leads to provider burnout, as well as the stressors that we talked about mm. with people like Dr. Breen. So there's no question that we were putting extraordinary pressure on both the staffing model and the, and the physical nature of what we were asking people to accomplish. And just briefly, I have to imagine there are so many um, students who uh, have been for perhaps years on the path to joining the healthcare profession. Well, what do you say to them at this moment? Um, looking ahead, you know, I suspect some of them may be scared off by what they've seen. Others perhaps are uh, trying to answer the call. But what do you say to those people who are trying to consider what to do with their lives and whether to dedicate their careers to this profession? Well, it's a noble profession uh, to, to care for sick patients. Uh, I think we are very fortunate in this country to have a great educational system of training physicians, nurses, physicians assistants, respiratory therapists, and so on. Um, what I found through this was the dedication, the stick to the morale, the, you know, don't worry, Dr. Corwin, we've got this, was just extraordinary. I mean, it, would, it, it was humbling for me because people putting their lives on the line who were doing it willingly and knowingly um, and were doing it uh, because they wanted to care for others. I think people will always want to go into healing professions. This was an extraordinary circumstance, a black swan, if you will. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if another one happens. Um, but the thing that's given me the most joy and pride uh, is the way that people rose to that challenge. And as I said before, in terms of this issue of, of you know, how do you look at the finances of that? You can't ask people to run through walls for you and then turn around and lay them off. It's just, it's just morally reprehensible to me. These people went above and beyond. And I think you'll see people wanting to do that in medicine. Uh, we've had so many people uh, who, who graduated early from medical school volunteering, nursing students volunteering, uh, dental students volunteering to help. Uh, it really has been heartwarming. Mm -hmm. Well, we owe all of those on the front lines a deep debt of gratitude. Thank you all for joining us for today's call. And thanks especially to you, Dr. Corwin. Oh, thanks, David. I really appreciate it. To find out more about our full slate of digital events, including the next installment of Corner Office Live, please visit timesevents.nytimes.com. And please subscribe to the New York Times. It's the support of listeners and readers like you that makes our reporting possible. We look forward to speaking with you again, and thank you all very much.